So, uh, this is going to be now a problem solving session and uh, also a slowly it will move into a discussion session and now there are a few issues which I have not talked about during my formal lecture today, a very long lecture and I hope you have had the patience to absorb it. Things will sink in and it is very good that we have a weekend in between to absorb the uh, import of the law, the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, come to page 7 of your exercise sheet and there is a section there titled the second law and there is a uh, statement or a paragraph, three line paragraph. Whenever you work with the second law, keep the following questions in mind. Does the process satisfy the second law? Is it possible, reversible or irreversible? Is it impossible, reversible or irreversible? If irreversible, what are the causes or likely causes or irreversibility? There is a typo there, which I will correct in the next version. Uh, there are uh, I think 10 exercises here, all 10 are uh, recommended, but let us uh, take a few of these, so that we understand what is happening. Let us take S L 2 first. We have 1 kg of water. Notice that it is absolutely necessary to patiently read, if not the numerical, but at least the scheme of a problem. And if you are solving it in a group, read it aloud and think aloud. 1 kg of water in a cylinder piston arrangement, so naturally it is expanding, likely to expand, is initially in the saturated liquid state at 8 bar. It absorbs heat from a reservoir at 250 degree C. So, there is a heat absorption. During the process, the piston moves in such a way that the pressure remains constant. So, isobaric process. At the end of the process, the water has completely evaporated into steam. So, that means we are going from the saturated liquid state to the dry saturated vapor state. Determine a heat transfer, B change in entropy of the system, C change in entropy of the universe and D change in of the reservoir and change in entropy of the universe. Two items here, change in entropy of the reservoir, we have not seen how to do that, we will soon do it and change in entropy of the universe, what universe is this? That also we will explore as we come to the as to the solution of this problem. First system diagram, we can sketch the system diagram, it is a cylinder piston arrangement. Our system preferably shown by dotted lines. And then there is a reservoir, T reservoir is 250 degrees C. There is a heat transfer from the reservoir to the system, some amount is Q. There is a, it expands, so there is a work of expansion. There is no mention of a stirrer, no hint of a stirrer or electric work. So, let us assume, I will write here assumptions, W other is 0 and that makes this W expansion to be W. We have 1 kg water. The initial state 1 is 
saturated liquid. P 1 is 8 bar, final state 2 dry saturated vapor, mark the word completely evaporated into steam. Process in such a way that the pressure remains constant. So, this means P 2 is also equal to 8 bar. Now, the process diagram, it is very easy, you can draw the process diagram either on the P V plane or on the T S plane. I am using specific volume and specific entropy. On the P V plane, it will look like this on the T s plane it will look like this and assume 8 bar is here like this, 8 bar may go something like this. Okay. So, state 1 is saturated liquid, state 2 is dry saturated vapor, the process on the P v plane looks like this. On the T s plane, this is the initial state, this is the final state the process looks like this. Notice that since the process takes place at constant pressure, but it during the process throughout we have a two phase mixture, except at the initial point where we have pure water and the final point, final state where we have pure steam. It is always two phases in equilibrium with each other and by our phase rule, pressure constant in two phase domain means temperature constant. So, although the pressure is given to be constant and it is an isobaric process, the way it is executed in the two phase zone, it is also an isothermal process. So, this is an illustration where you have a process which is isobaric as well as isothermal. So, do not be under the impression that a process which is isobaric cannot be isothermal. Okay. Now, of course, we will assume the process to be quasi static. And if you assume the process to be quasi static, only then uh, you can show these processes. And the hint to assume it quasi static is the phrase pressure remains constant. And that means, this area in the P V diagram is the work done, expansion work done, which in this case is also the total work done, because w other is 0. We do not have to calculate the work done, but now let us proceed. Okay. We have to determine heat transfer and to determine heat transfer, we have no choice. Remember that, remember that statement, heat interaction is related to the rest of the world only through the first law of thermodynamics. So, we have Q equals delta E plus W. Our assumption is that we will again assume here that the stuff is at rest. So, we will assume delta E is delta U. We have already noticed that W is W expansion. So, this becomes delta U plus W expansion. W expansion is at constant pressure. So, it is integral P d V that is P delta V, delta U plus P delta V, which is delta U plus delta P V, which gives us delta H. And that 
that means this is going to be m into delta h and because 2 is the dry saturated vapor state, 1 is the saturated liquid state, this delta h 1 2 will be h f g at 8 bar. And if you look up h f g at 8 bar, go down in your steam tables, page 6, page 7, page 8, our pressure is 8 bar, right? Yes, our pressure is 8 bar. And H F G is uh, 2048.0 kilojoule per kilogram. Oh, why it's both. Two zero four eight point zero kilo joule per kilogram, and just we'll also note down because we are likely to have it. This is SFG at eight bar, and that, according to the tables, is four point six one seven kilo joule per kilogram Kelvin. Our mass is 1 kg. So, because mass is 1 kg, our Q now turns out to be 2048.0 kilo joule. That is the first answer. What was the second part of the question? Change in entropy of the system, that is simple we already have this delta s of the system is m s 1 2 s 1 2 we have determined here. So, this is 4.617 kilo joule per Kelvin. Notice that the unit of entropy is unit of energy divided by unit of temperature kilo joule per Kelvin. So, that is answer B. Now, the third answer change in entropy of the reservoir and change in entropy of the universe. Now, why do we need the change in entropy of the reservoir? If you go back, notice this diagram of ours. We say if you want to determine whether the process is possible or not, we have to evaluate dq by t on this surface. Now, we are told that the pressure is maintained constant, but as the heat is flowing into the system, we do not know what is the temperature at the interface. We have to make some assumption. So, instead of that, quite often what is done is the following and this is, let me talk in some generalities now. Suppose, you have a system A and a system B and there is a heat interaction say from B to A, but the heat interaction is such and the process may be non quasi static to such an extent that it is virtually impossible to evaluate d q by t. In that case, what we do is we say that look, we do not want to evaluate d q by t. What we will do is we will combine this system A with the system from which it is or it absorbed heat during the process and consider that to be a bigger system. And we will study the process in such a way and study the process again to see whether A and B together is an adiabatic system. 
if A and I would say extended, extended that is with respect to A, a diabetic system. If during the process B is interchanging heat with a C, include that C also, till we reach an extended adiabatic system. Okay. And such an extended adiabatic system is given the name thermodynamic universe or simply universe because our course is thermodynamic. So, this thermodynamic universe or simply universe in our course is not the astronomical universe or the physical universe. It is just an extension of the system from the system under study along with that include any systems which directly or indirectly exchange heat with that system such that the extended system is an adiabatic system and that extended adiabatic system is a universe. The idea of this is universe is made up of in this particular case A and B. In this particular case B will be the reservoir, A will be the cylinder piston containing steam. And because A and B is an adiabatic system, delta S universe, which is delta S A plus delta S B, this will now have to be greater than or equal to 0. That way we can check whether the second law is satisfied or not without the need for evaluating d q by t. So, the question such as what was the temperature at the interface when this heat was transferred? did it remain the saturation temperature at 8 bar, which was the pressure during the process or was it something different? Because saturation temperature at 8 bar, if you go to your document, you will notice that at 8 bar it is 170.4 degrees C. The reservoir is at 250 degrees C. So, the temperature here could be slightly higher than 174 degrees C. So, we do not have to worry about such things when you use the idea of a thermodynamic universe. So, in our case, universe is nothing but system plus reservoir. So, delta S universe is delta S the change in entropy of the system plus delta S of the reservoir. Now, the question is what is delta S of the reservoir? Now, a reservoir we have seen is a large enough system such that any finite amount of heat transfer to or from it does not change its temperature. We can consider this to be to mean that a finite amount of uh, heat transfer to and from the reservoir is essentially a reversible process and then the delta S of the reservoir simply becomes heat absorbed by the reservoir divided by T reservoir. And now here we come back to our basic idea of what is heat? Heat is energy in transit, it cannot be ever contained in a system. So, the heat transfer into the system Q, which we have determined here as uh, 2048 kilojoules, must be the heat transferred out of the reservoir, it cannot go to any third place. And that means, heat absorbed by the reservoir must be minus q, which is minus 2048 kilo T reservoir is 250 degrees C, which is 
fifty plus two seventy three point one five k, and that means delta S reservoir is minus two zero four eight divided by two fifty plus two seventy three point one five kilo joule per kelvin. Never forget to write the units even when you write a formula and you calculate this out and then you calculate delta S universe as the sum of this delta S r and the delta S for the system which we have already determined and check whether it is positive, negative or 0. In this particular case, because it is just the first problem, let me complete it. We have 2048 divided by 250 plus 273.15 that is 523.15 that turns out to be minus 3.915 kilo joule per Kelvin our delta S system, how much was it? 4.617. So, this is 4.617 plus minus 3.915 kilo joule per kg, whatever is that number. Zero point seven zero two. Write it specifically as plus zero point seven zero two kilo joule per kg, which is greater than zero, and that means it is a possible irreversible process. And when you do this, you should not stop there, you should write a comment about what is the cause of the irreversibility or the likely cause of the irreversibility. And it is very clear from here that if you look up our steam tables, if we are maintaining the system at 8 bar, the saturation temperature is 170.4. So, when the reservoir is at uh, 250 degree C, this is at um, about 70, 80 degree C below that. So, you have a temperature uh, difference across which this heat is transferred and that seems to be the or that is the cause of this entropy change of the universe and that is the major cause of the irreversibility. Let me look at one more problem. Okay, let us take it is a biggish problem, but interesting. SL3, SL3, we have a thermally insulated cylinder closed at both ends. So, overall constant volume, overall insulated. But inside it is a leak proof frictionless diathermic piston, okay, which divides the cylinder into two parts. Initially, the cylinder is clamped in the center, so two equal parts with 1 liter of air at 300 k and 3 bar on one side and 1 liter of air at 300 k and 1 bar on the other side. That means, the temperature is the same but the pressures are different. One is 1 bar and one is 3 bar. The piston is released and reaches equilibrium in pressure and temperature at a new position. The pressure is different. So, the 3 bar side will try to expand into the 1 bar side and finally, at some stage 
actually if you really look at it from a purist point of view, uh, maybe it will never come to a rest because it is frictionless. But anyway, assuming that somehow it comes to rest finally and reaches equilibrium in pressure and temperature at a new position, compute the final pressure and temperature and change in entropy. What irreversible process has taken place? Or which irreversible process, make that plural, which irreversible processes may have taken place. Okay. So, let us sketch it. We have, we will do it algebraically, numbers you can substitute. Let us consider our system is made up of this whole thing, two gases. And let us to begin with neglect the volume occupied by the piston. Later on we will see whether that is a good assumption or not and whether the piston will play any role or not. It is a diathermic piston, so it will allow any heat transfer across it. On one side, both volumes are initially equal, let me call them V naught and V naught. And uh, on one side, you have 300 K, so initially this temperature is T naught, this temperature is T naught. But the pressure here is 1 bar, pressure here is 3 bar, let us say this is P naught 1 and this is P naught or this is P naught A and this is P naught B. So, let me say this is the A side of the system, this is the B side of the system. So, this is what is shown here is initial state. It says 1 liter of air And our standard assumption air is an ideal gas constant C P C V. It is not uh, written anything, but it is a good idea. If need be, we will assume C P and gamma as given in SL 4. C p is 1.0 kilo joule per kilogram Kelvin, gamma is 1.4. Okay. Now, what happens since P 0 b is higher than P 0 a, the piston will tend to move towards the right. And finally, the equilibrium position if I sketch it is likely to be something like this. So, this is the A part, this is the B part. Remember that this is a diathermic piston. So, although it moves slowly, even if there are temperature differences, see initially what will happen? This will expand. As it expands, if this were adiabatic, this would have cooled down, this would have heated up because of compression. But then because of the temperature difference and the diathermic characteristic of the piston, heat would get transferred. And finally, you will end up with a temperature T 1 on this side and T 1 on this side. Okay. You will end up with a pressure P 1 on this side and P 1 on this side, equal because the it is a leak proof frictionless piston. If it were to leak, again pressure would be equal. If it were to have friction, then pressure would be unequal, but it is it is leak proof, but it is frictionless, so the pressure will be equal. Let us say now this is the volume is V 1 A and this volume is V 1 B. Volumes would be different. Temperatures equal because of uh, diathermic property, 
pressure is equal because of frictionless piston. Okay. Now, what are the relations that we have? Remember that we have to, we have the following unknowns T 1, P 1, V 1 A, V 1 B. Everything here is known. First relation is the first law, the whole thing is insulated, it is at rest it is rigid. So, for the full system, the complete system dotted line as shown and this whole dotted line and for the time being neglecting the volume occupied by the piston or the presence of the piston itself. Delta E for the system will be Q minus W equals 0 because Q is 0, insulated vessel, W is 0, rigid vessel, no mention of a non-PDV work. And mind you, do not confuse, I am not looking at A and B as a system. This is for my system which is A and B. Okay. Next, assume stationary. So, that means, delta E is 0, that gives me delta U to be also 0. Then, notice that we have ideal gas. So, delta U of our ideal gas will depend only of temperature and delta U will be now made up of delta U A plus delta U B and from the initial pressure volume temperature, we can determine the mass of A and mass of B. So, this will become mass of A C V of A into temperature difference of A that is T 1 plus T naught plus mass of B C V, this is the same air. So, 1 C V I will use T 1 minus T naught. Note that either side changes its temperature from T naught to T 1, but since this is 0 and T 1 minus T naught is a common factor, the first conclusion is T 1 equals T naught. And we have used the first law of thermodynamics. Now, what about the pressures? which are the other equations we have with us? We have equation of state of the two components. For A, we are going to have, let me look at it, P V equals R T. So, we are going to have P not A, V not divided by T not. This is going to be equal to P 1 V 1 A divided by T 1 which is T not. This is T 1, but which is equal to T naught. This is the equation of state for part A. Equation of state for part B, P naught B V naught, initially same volume. This will be P 1 V 1 B divided by T naught here, divided by T naught which is equal to T 1 divided by T 1, which is equal to T naught here. So, now you will notice that because the temperatures remain the same, you have these two relations along with the relation that it is a rigid container. So, the total initial volume is V naught plus V naught, the total final volume is V 1 A plus V 1 B. 
and you will use these three relations to obtain the values of v 1 a and v 1 b and p naught a and p naught b. So, this way you would have determined the values of t naught, you would have determined the values of sorry values of t 1 which is t naught, p 1, v 1 a and v 1 Remember, you have three equations 1, 2, 3 and you will be solving them for these three unknowns P 1, V 1 A and V 1 B. So, that means, now we know the initial state completely and the final state completely and calculating the delta S, this is an adiabatic system. So, the system itself is a universe and the second law would say that the change in entropy of an adiabatic system would be greater than 0. So, delta S would be delta S of the A part plus delta S of the B part and you would notice that the temperatures remain the same, the pressures differ. So, you will use a isothermal process from P 1 to P 2 or P naught A to V naught, uh, P naught A to P 1 and P naught B to P 1 to determine the change in entropy and you will be able to calculate this, calculate that and show that it is greater than 0 for the given data. And then the question is why is it greater than 0? There are two possibilities here, one possibility is what is the causes of irreversibility. There are two possible causes of irreversibility and both would have contributed to some extent. Initially, when we release the piston, the piston would suddenly start accelerating. So, that would mean a non quasi static process, an imbalance in pressure on either side. On one side it is 1 bar, on the other side it is 3 bar. So, sudden expansion because P naught A is not equal to P naught B. But there is another contributor too. As the part B expands into part A, we will notice that the temperature of part B will start reducing from T naught. Temperature of part A would start increasing from T naught but there is a diathermic wall, a conducting piston. So, slowly there will be a heat transfer from the higher temperature part which would be A to a lower temperature part which would be B and that would be across a finite temperature difference. So, there is also a possibility of Q across the piston. finite delta t. These two would contribute in some part to the irreversibility of the process. Now, I will give you some homework and the homework is simple. today. I said while deriving many things that I am leaving this as an exercise to you. So, uh, do those exercises. Uh, if you want any hints, the five books listed at the beginning of the exercise sheet, you will find enough hints in one or more of these books. The Second one is solve all exercises up to 
S L 10. And in particular, the S L sheet, every problem analyze it and find out whether it is possible, impossible and what are the possible causes of uh, irreversibility. Okay. Uh, as, uh, as teachers, I quite often uh, find that although for students, we have, uh, uh, we set up problems with numerical, so that we would like to have a numerical answer. As teachers, quite often it is uh, nice if we do the problem algebraically. That means, let there be some numbers, but we work with algebra showing at every stage that the number of equations is number of unknowns, is equal to the number of unknowns. That way, we are on uh, solid ground as we solve the problems. We can always substitute numbers and uh, uh, get the numerical answers. So, that is the end of the uh, formal session today. Now, a gap of one minute and then I will take questions from various centers. Okay, I think I will start taking, we have Hyderabad, Nagpur, Amal Jyoti, Trichy and Panvel. Ah, Here is our friend Brahmara. So, good afternoon Brahmara, over to you. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, this is regarding the test. Uh, a couple of questions are there, sir. I'll uh, pass down the mic to the participant. Test, test. Questions regarding the test. So, you are the author, so you should be here. Be here. If need be, I'll pass on the microphone. The test was set up and uh, uh, modeled or uh, proctored by uh, Professor Bhandarkar. So, I am keeping him around. So, he should uh, get the bouquets for the test as, as well as face the brick bats for the test, second test which was conducted yesterday. Go ahead, over. For constant product process, heat transfer is equal to Options are given as MCB DT, MCB DT, work done is equal to 0, heat transfer is equal to 0. All are correct answers. Oh, uh, see, uh, the questions were randomly rearranged for students. So, uh, do not ask about the last question. Can you read the question? Over to you. For constant brother process, which of the which of the following is correct? Q is equal to MCB DT, Q is equal to MCB DT, work done is equal to 0, heat transfer is equal to 0. Answer is given as all, all the above. How it is, sir? Yes, uh, I think uh, the question is in a constant pressure process, which is, um, which of the statements is correct? Is that correct? You say over. Over. So, I think the choices are Q is MCP DT, Q is MCV DT, maybe Q is 0, W is 0. Those were the choices. Uh, the answer was all of them can be possible. So, if you want, maybe you can create an example for each of these. Uh, is that something that you want or you just wanted the answer? I can have the heat input equal to MCV delta T and have the remaining put in by stirrer work. That is a possibility and give you and uh, I let it expand at constant pressure. So, that will give you Q is uh, uh, MCV delta T and uh, a third case where I could have no Q at all, only the stirrer work would be put in and the piston would expand at constant pressure in which case I would have a constant pressure process where, um, um, you know, the Q is 0. Which is also adiabatic. Which is also adiabatic. So, those were the cases for Q. Over. Thank you, sir. Over. Over.
over and out, let us go to some other center. NIT Trichy, over to you. I want to ask only one question. Um, in classes uh, inequality derivation, um, in the middle uh, we came uh, after uh, uh, after attaching one more um, uh, one more thermal reservoir T0. Uh, work done was uh, Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. Initially, uh, uh, if you are not assume it, uh, classes equation is uh, uh, not correct. Uh, it, it will be true for uh, uh, in, uh, I mean uh, for first statement uh, classes classes statement uh, real one. So uh, we can prove uh, classes statement uh, itself is wrong. Over to you, sir. No, I I, I don't understand. See the Clausius inequality. You want to talk about Clausius inequality or Clausius statement of second law? Over. Cla when uh, three, when uh, three T device used it, sir, three th uh, thermal reservoirs, and uh, we attached with one more thermal reservoir, T zero. Over to you, sir. Okay, so your uh, question is about uh, three reservoir uh, cycle, or three reservoir or a three T engine. Okay, the what you do is the following. I will show it to you on the whiteboard and uh, I think I will mute you or uh, detach you uh, because of the audio that will improve the audio. I will come back to you just so be there. Let us say that I have a cycle which has three interactions. One at T 1, one at T 2, one at T 3. And let us say this interaction is Q 1, this interaction is Q 2, this interaction is Q 3. The moment you do this, that means you are going to produce work equal to q1 plus q2 plus q3 because it is a cyclic device okay now we want to prove that q1 by t1 plus q2 by t2 plus q3 by t3 is less than or equal to 0 okay what we do is we assume the negative of this. Okay. That means, we assume that q 1 by t 1 plus q 2 by t 2 plus q 3 by t 3 is greater than 0. Okay. Now, we do the following. Let us take a reservoir at t naught and I will create a reversible engine R 1, which will take in Q naught 1 from the reservoir, provide Q 1 to this cyclic device and provide work output, let us say W 1. Similarly, I will create, set up another reversible cyclic device R 2, which takes in Q naught 2 and produces W 2 and provides Q 2 here. Now, for the third one also do and this way you can generalize W 3 okay. and this is Q naught 3. Now, look at this device. in that big thing. This happens to be a 1 T machine. Let me just now call it a machine. Okay. 
what is the total work that it produces? The total work that is produces is W plus W 1 plus W 3 plus W 2. Now, let us check whether this is this is greater than greater than 0 or less than 0. If it is greater than 0 under these conditions with this assumption, then we have set up a 1 T machine and that means this assumption would be wrong because with this assumption you are able to set up a 1 T machine. And if you want the detail, the detail would go like this or will go something like this. What is W 1? W 1 would be efficiency of R 1 into Q 0 1, the heat absorbed by 1. And since R 1 is a reversible machine working between, you go back, R 1 is a reversible machine working between T naught and T 1, the efficiency of R 1 will be 1 minus T 1 by T naught. And in a similar fashion, you will write an expression for W 2, you will write an expression for W 3. Substitute all these equation expressions along with the expression for W into the equation here, in this equation and then you will in sorry in this equation and then you will check that under this condition, whether you get a positive work output from the, that means this term is positive or not. If it is positive under this condition, that means under this condition, you are able to uh, set up a 1 T heat engine, which is impossibility from the second law and hence this assumption must be wrong and that brings you to the proof of this Clausius inequality for a 3 T machine. I will leave it to you now to complete this derivation. This was where N i t 3 g right. So, I think uh, you spend some time on this and you should be able to complete this. Over. Let me go to some other center now. Pillai, over to you. For an ideal gas in a constant pressure process, the following is possible and out of the four options, one option is W is equal to 0. So, can you elaborate sir? Okay. Remember ideal gas or any fluid constant pressure process I can have a constant pressure process in which W expansion is positive, but simultaneously I can have a W stirrer which is negative. So, by adjusting the amount of expansion that is delta V and amount of W stirrer which can be independently adjusted, we can, I will 
I'll just uh, Uh, it is possible for us to adjust this to be equal to 0 by making this positive. We have just now seen that this will always be negative. This is negative, this is positive, this is p delta v and this is tau omega t. So, you have enough parameters here to adjust them to make the total work equal to 0. So, I think that is the question which you had. Over to you. Uh, there is one more question, sir. It's regarding the uh, water at atmospheric air is and the options water exists at uh, normal atmospheric air as and the option given were superheated steam, saturated vapor, saturated liquid, and wet steam. I think your question is about the water vapor under uh, in the atmosphere, right? Over to you. Okay, I think this has been discussed on Moodle. Please uh, refer to the Moodle discussions. Okay. That way, I will save some time, and I'll be able to go to some other center. Over and out. College of Engineering, Pune. Over to you. Just one question, please, so that I can go to other centers. Over. If heat transfer is through finite temperature difference for finding dq by t, which temperature has to be taken? Over. Okay. Now, the question is, when there is a finite temperature difference, which temperature should you take? In fact, that is precisely the problem which we saw in SL2. We had a reservoir which was at 250 degrees C, whereas we had a system okay, and uh, at 8 bar we noticed that the this temperature is 174, 170.4 degrees C, the temperature of the system. I think the question arises which temperature do you take and precisely for this since on the border line we do not know what temperature it is, we do not use the d q by t formulation. We do not use this because we do not know what t is and sometimes we do not even know what d q is, but in this problem that issue does not arise. So, in that case what we do is see the idea is if you look at it from a system, you have delta S for the system, d q for the system and t for the system. So, either we check delta S is greater than or equal to d q by t integral, but if this cannot be evaluated because of such confusion, then what you we do? is this d q comes from some other system that will have a delta s b associated with it and then we consider the whole system and go on adding system till we get an adiabatic super system known as the universe and then all that we check is delta s universe which is delta s plus delta s b to be greater than or equal to 0. The requirement is precisely that. Over to you. Ah, thank you, sir. I have one more question. May I ask? Yes, go ahead. Over. Uh, sir, uh, will you please elaborate what is Joule's constant and whether it is correct to introduce Joule's constant experiment after first of thermodynamics in the class. Joules. Which constants are you talking about? Joules constant. Joules, const, Joules constant. I, I do not know. I do not know what you mean by that. Over to you. Significance of Joules constant. Relation between heat and work. 
oh you mean the the so called constant which was uh, talked about as the mechanical equivalent of heat that is uh, i think in some unit it is 4.186 kilo calorie per kilo joules if that is the type of constant you are going to talk about then for us 4.186 for us the constants like 4.186 kilo calorie per kilo joule is nothing special this is a conversion factor in this course we will use joule kilo joule mega joule etc so there is no need for this constant there is nothing special about that constant it's only a conversion factor over to you okay thank you sir balchan sangli over to you hello sir my question is how will you find entropy change in irreversible process your question is how to determine change in entropy during an irreversible process if that is the question then the answer is very clear entropy change i will uh, start the writing entropy change depends only on end states initial and final state does not depend on the process it's a change in property over to you uh, but sir hello how will you find entropy uh, production factor over question is how do you calculate entropy production so entropy production for a process sp is defined as change in entropy of the system minus integral dq by t for that process so this part depends on the process this part also depends on the process but this part depends only on initial state and final state so all that you do is find out the initial state and final state determine delta s from that find out the detail from the process determine dq by t and the difference gives you sp over to you uh, but sir uh, for irreversible process how will you evaluate integral over to you this was precisely the uh, discussion which took place earlier so not possible to evaluate for non quasi static that means irreversible processes now in that case use the delta s universe method and then note if you have not already noted that delta s universe is entropy production of the universe over to you okay sir over and out 
VNIT Nagpur over to you. Sir, how do we calculate the increase in the entropy of the system in case of free expansion in an insulated uh, chamber? Over to you. I think there is a common uh, confusion here. Never ask how to calculate delta S of a system during dash 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 process. This is meaningless. We delta S is S 2 minus S 1, final state, initial state. So, process does not matter, forget the real process. There are two ways of doing this. One method is use tables. This is as in case of water steam. The second method is forget the given process, set up a convenient reversible process from 1 to 2, evaluate d q by t integral for this reversible process. This is equal to delta s 1 to 2. So, there is no point in asking how to evaluate the change in entropy for a non quasi static process, for an irreversible process or anything like that. All you need to know is the initial state and the final state. The moment you know the initial state and the final state, you know what the entropy change is. Either you go to tables as in case of steam and read it out. And if you want, you can make a big table for various pressures and various temperatures for air. Just print it out and then simply read it out. Or because air has a simple equation of state, uh, you can uh, uh, integrate d q by t for a convenient reversible process. And that will be your delta S 1 2. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Over and out. Kamins Pune, over to you. Hello. Uh, my question to you is about uh, the phase diagram of water. If you look at uh, the critical point, then on the right and top of the critical point lies the, uh, uh, the superheated, uh, rather the supercritical steam. What lies, uh, which phase lies on the left and top of the critical point? Over to you. Good question. Now, traditionally this zone is known as superheated vapor. Even if it is created by sublimation, it is superheated vapor. This is the critical point. So, this is critical temperature and this is critical pressure. Uh, actually, 
actually if you look at it at the critical point, the distinction between liquid and vapor vanishes. So, in principle you can go from a liquid state here to a superheated state here by two methods. Either you can go along an isobaric process in which when you cross this point, you will go through the process of evaporation. You will see bubbles forming. If you see slowly enough, you will find a meniscus, a distinct liquid and vapor phase as it boils. Or you can do the following. You can compress it either isothermally or adiabatically to a pressure higher than the critical pressure, then do isobaric heating and then reduce the temperature sorry reduce the pressure to whatever you want either isothermally or uh, adiabatically. By this method you will be able to go from a liquid state at A to a vapor state at B without ever seeing a meniscus you will always remain within single phase and because of that you will wonder whether here you have reached a, a vapor state or not, but you can demonstrate you have reached a vapor state by isobarically cooling it to a lower temperature and then here you will see it is condensation. So, the here and here and here and particularly in this zone whether to call it supercritical liquid or highly compressed liquid or supercritical vapor that is left to uh, you and me, whoever uses that. Okay. There is no strict definition of it. Over to you. Thank you sir, thanks a lot. Uh, there is one more question here. Uh, my question is, uh, we have studied first law and first law and second law. Uh, in that, uh, perpetual motion machine of first kind and perpetual motion machine of second kind. So, what are the relations with respect to thermodynamics and uh, applications in classical thermodynamics with that? Over to you. See, uh, perpetual motion machines, these are, you know, people have been teaching thermodynamics and you want to always create props and buzzwords and things like that to uh, uh, be able to create interest and also to explain to layman in quick words, pithy words what it is. A perpetual motion machine is something like this and there are various kinds of perpetual motion machines. A perpetual motion machine quickly for us we can now define a perpetual motion machine of the first kind is something which uh, violates the first law of thermodynamics. That means, you can produce uh, uh, work without either absorbing heat or without reducing the energy of anything. That means, work out of nothing. So, that is a machine which violates the first law of thermodynamics. For example, you know some cranky person will come up and say that look I have a car and instead of um, uh, you know a small car, in nowadays you have that Reva or something like that, uh, you have a car running on batteries. So, okay, it has electric motors running the wheels, it has a battery, but the battery needs to be uh, periodically charged. So, every evening you take it in your garage and connect it to a uh, power outlet. And then somebody says, I will put a, a windmill on top of that uh, car, so that as the car moves, it will, uh, uh, the windmill will uh, uh, rotate, it will create power and uh, it will charge the batteries and if I adjust it properly, I will uh, not need the batteries, because as the car moves, the windmill will create the electricity, electricity will move the car, the car will move and because of the car's movement, the ram air will uh, move the windmill. So, this is typically a perpetual motion machine of the first kind. A perpetual motion machine of the second kind, it is something which violates the second law of thermodynamics.
that means it assumes that you know what we today morning discussed as the 1 T heat engine that is a perpetual motion machine of the second kind. We, we will develop thermodynamics without talking about uh, this, but in old textbooks of thermodynamics will always be talking about perpetual motion machine of the first kind and perpetual motion machine of the second kind, that is it. Over to you. Thank you sir, over and out. Thank you very much, that is the end of the half the course, we meet Monday morning, over and out. Thank you.